Hello, how are you? Patrick here with a quick introduction to this week's episode. If you listened to or watched last week's episode, you will know that Ben has a new book out called Unlocking Potential. You can find it on the Amazons. Uh, just give it a quick search, or I'm sure at this point, Ben has posted on Instagram, so you can find some links there as well. Either way, Unlocking Potential is the name of the book. In the last week's episode, we talked about some of the big ideas inside the book. And this week, I'm really excited. We're joined by Christine Bald. Christine is Ben's co-writer on this project. I really wanted to have her in to talk about the process of writing a book. We talk a lot on this show about focusing on the process. And from my perspective, watching Ben and Christine work on this book for the last few years, I thought it was a great example of what it means to focus on the process. And so that's what we're going to talk about in this episode. Again, if you haven't yet, check out the book. It's called Unlocking Potential. Let's get into the conversation. We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run, always chasing, never stop. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Chasing Excellence. Today we are joined by a mutual friend and somebody I think every, a lot of folks know of, but probably haven't heard the voice of in a, uh, before. Uh, we're joined with, by Christine Bald. How are you, Christine? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. Please, we're we're pumped for it. So obviously, you are the three of us are good friends. Uh, this will be your introduction to the show. But I, I, like I said, I think a lot of people at least know you, maybe your name, and certainly your work. Um, a lot of folks will will know, will have read much of your work through the Dave Castro Instagram account through from the games. Um, we are actually a couple months out from the games, but you did it for the second year this year. You took over Dave's uh, Instagram account and did what we always lovingly refer to as photo journal. I don't know what other people will call it um, other than like, who's this person writing long captions about Dave and the third person uh, during the CrossFit games. And so I, just as just as a way of introducing yourself and so folks kind of know you, I'd love to know the story of how you or the, I, I know it. I love other people know the story of how you got into this kind of thing. Like this isn't a, nobody goes to college to be like, I'm going to, I'm going to write long form captions on Instagram. So I just like, I'd love for you to just kind of give us the trajectory of how you started working on that and, and where it is now and kind of what you're looking to looking ahead for, uh, in the future, in the future. Well, the first time I ever did a photo journal, uh, it was for Ben during a comp train camp. It was my first one very shortly after moving to Natick. I think I had been here maybe a month. And we had a comp train camp coming in, and Ben asked me to kind of help out with media. And he didn't define any parameters on what that might mean. So I kind of pitched a photo journal to him, and he was like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but sure, go do that. <laughs> So I did that and he liked it and some of the participants, like all of the participants really seemed to like it. So I ended up doing that semi-regularly over the next, what, two or three years at CompTrain during CompTrain camps, sometimes during the games for CompTrain. Uh, and then 2020 happened and the 2020 CrossFit game season was so wild between um, COVID and Greg Glassman leaving and athletes withdrawing out of protest for some of the things that had been said um, online and elsewhere. And the games very nearly didn't happen. And the whole time, the, I'm just kind of down in Florida writing, working on Ben's book. And I'm like, who is going to tell, like, someone should be telling this story. This is so crazy. And it occurred to me, I was like, I should just do it. <laughs> and so I sent uh, Dave a letter that I typed and wrote, along with a lot of examples of what I wanted to say and kind of the story that I thought that they should be telling about the season. And I sent it to him on the ranch and Dave at this point has no idea who I am. We've never met, never spoken. And I didn't hear anything and I wasn't surprised. And then two months later, I get a text from Dave and he's like, Hey, you want to come to the ranch and do the thing that you said? And I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he invited me out to Aromas and we did the first one out there went really well. It was a very different games. So there weren't yeah. as nearly as many stories to tell as this past games. So being able to go back this year for the 2021 games back in Madison was awesome. There were so many stories to tell and it was a lot of fun. 
we, th this isn't the point of having you on the show, but this is fun. And I think this is maybe the only opportunity we have to kind of talk about this, but I'd love for you to just like, I don't know if people appreciate what it's like to do what you do in the, in the context in which you're doing it. Can you just tell people like, how do you actually get from, oh, I'm at the games and this is cool. I've got a front row seat to, you know, five, six, seven, 700, 800 word essays written on your phone a, a day for five or six days. Like, can you just talk about the process just a little bit? Just so it's people just can a lot of caffeine. kind of peek behind the So much caffeine and no sleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's really just, I heard um, on, I think it was some Apple show, the deer with something with Lin-Manuel Miranda, who is a writer that I admire a lot. And he said something to the effect of um, so much of writing is about meeting the moment as honestly as possible. And whenever I get it right, whenever people really respond to, you know, a post or whatever I write, I find that that's what I've been able to do. So this year I was trying to be very, very cognizant instead of just kind of observing the process of the games, trying to like, be very observant of the emotion of what was happening and the story of the people involved. And so a lot of it is just standing on the sidelines, kind of just not really focusing on anything, just kind of looking around, seeing what's happening, trying to position myself, um, not so much as to look at what was happening on the floor, because everyone can see that on the feed, mm -hmm. but trying to look at what's happening on the sidelines, in the tunnel, in the warm up area, after, um, and trying to just as honestly as possible convey those moments. Love that. Okay. On my so phone, mentioned very quickly. <laughs> on your phone, very quickly, typing very fast. Um, so I mentioned that, that obviously that's not the reason we have you on the show. Uh, in our last episode, uh, Ben and I talked about his new book, your new book, Unlocking Potential. Um, and we talked a lot about kind of some of the concepts inside of the book, some of the ideas inside the book. And uh, I wanted to have you on as a follow up because I'm really interested in because I've seen it enough to, to know that it's that that it's worth talking about. At least it's interesting enough. This this process that you guys have in place for writing together. And so for maybe just a little bit of context, you and Ben worked on Chasing Excellence together, the first book, not the podcast, the book. Um, and then at some point in the last couple of years, you decided to sit down and, OK, what is the next book? What do we want that to look like? And so I'd love to get a little bit of context from both of you on what does it look like to say, yeah, let's write a book and then figuring out what that is, what it means, you know, because I think a lot of people think, oh, let's write a book. And that book is perfectly formed in your heads. And it's just a matter of typing, right, and getting it out on, onto the page and then putting it out in the world. Uh, I'd love to hear from both of you. One, just the, the reality that that's not actually the case. But like, how do you maybe maybe, uh, Ben, you can start with the process that you you had in writing Chasing Excellence the first time around, just so people, again, maybe just continuing this theme of kind of pulling back the curtain a little bit. Can you talk about like what, where that book came from, how it started, and then where and how Christine got involved? Yeah, after the 2016 games, I coached the the male and female winners um, that year, Catherine Davis' daughter and Matt Fraser. And when I came back, and I had I have a kind of a, a monthly lunch with my best friend, who's uber successful, and we bounce ideas off each other. It's kind of this little peer group that we push each other and um, you know question each other. And when I came back, he was like, you got to write a book. And he'd been pushing me for a while about writing a book. And I was always kind of like standoff. But he's like, no, like if you're going to do one, like this is the time to do it. Um, so he, um, he, he's an amazing guy. He actually um, fronted me the money to like go and do it. And um, I hired up a, a company that did kind of did like the nuts and the whole thing. Like basically you could be the ghostwriter and they would do everything. So went through the process of that and um, wrote a book with this company. And I didn't like it. It wasn't good. And I had a hard conversation with uh, the kind of the guy that ran the company. I was like, look, like I know I, there's been a lot of hours, a lot of resources poured in this thing. I'm not really that proud of it. I, I, don't, not, I don't want to put this book out. He's like, okay, I get it. Maybe it was the writer. So did the whole process over again with a second writer. And when that came to fruition, um, you know, I'm reading it along and I'm just like, I'm still, I'm like, this isn't the book I want to write. Like this isn't what I want to do. So in the meantime, Christine had been doing, as she just talked about, had been doing quote unquote media for us, writing things for us. She's a massively talented writer. So I kind of turned to her and I was like, hey, you want to crack at writing a, writing a book with me? And she's like, I don't, 
I don't really know about writing a book. And I was like, just let's just write a chapter. So we just wrote a chapter and then one chapter led to another, led to another. And it ended up being Chasing Excellence, which I'm incredibly proud of. You know, it did incredibly well. The response has been phenomenal. Um, and um, once I finished that project with Christine, actually, I take that back. During that project, of do, during the process of doing that project with Christine, I knew I had other books in the works that I wanted to get out. Even right now, we're writing our second book and we constantly talk about books two, three, and four. Um, or actually books three, four, and five. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was kind of like the, the, the birth of the, of the working with Christine. Um, and our, I'd love to say our process is unorthodox, but I can't say that because I have no idea how other people write books. So <laughs> it's, it's a process that we, it's kind of really neat because we threw away the first draft the first time with Chasing Excellence, threw away the second draft the first time with Chasing Excellence. And the third one is kind of that came to life writing this new book, Unlocking Potential, even though Christine is incredibly talented, it was still the same process. We threw away drafts one and two. You know, Whether you call them MVPs, like minimal viable products, or shitty first drafts, they are what they are. And what we, you learn is it's so much about it is, and this is like one of our principles, we talk about this on, you know, both in our business, and Christine has heard this, we talk about this on the show, is just start. Like, if you try to wait to make it perfect, you're going to continue to wait and wait and wait. The best way to learn how to steer this thing in a different direction is to start and get the feet. So until we had, honestly, the first full book, it wasn't like we wrote a chapter. We're like, ah, no wrong direction. Like we wrote the whole book and we were like, this isn't getting it across. Mm-hmm. So you crumple it up, you save what's worthy, um, which we thought was a lot, but by the time you get down with the second draft, none of the first one exists at all. We've taken a completely different approach. The message is always the message, right? In the first one, it's about how to train world-class athletes. The second one is about how to get the most out of other people in terms of teams, organizations, and leadership. So the premise is the same, but it's the way it gets delivered. And the, all the nuancey stuff is super, super important because it's got to be captivating. It's got to be a story. It's got to have the right framework and the framework can even change. Um, and that was probably the biggest thing that changed as we went through the process was the framework of the way we're telling the story. Christine, you, it's, it's actually been mentioned at least to a degree a couple of times now, which is I know when you first started working with Dave at the games, you didn't have a lot of instruction. I remember talking to you about it and you were like, I don't really know what he wants. This is the first time. Like, I don't know what he's going to expect. I don't know what he's going to want. So I got to kind of prepare for anything to go down there. And my guess is that this current year was similar to it, though you've had some experience. And I know that you mentioned that the first photo journal for CompTrain, Ben was like, hey, you should come do that and go do that. And then you're like, okay, I guess I'll figure that out. And I think it was the same with the books. How do you start getting your head around Okay, I have a certain, I got a roughly designed goal here. Like, right up, we have to produce a book or we have to do this this photo journal thing. But that's as much instruction, that's as much constraint as this individual is going to give me. And now I've got to figure it out for myself. For you, what is the process of figuring out what 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 do they want? What am I going to be able to give them? What's going to be good? How am I going to get to that ultimate goal? How do you start that when it's such a clean slate? Well, it's totally different with Ben and Dave because of relationships. I've worked for Ben, you know, for, since 2016, very closely. Um, I used to coach his 6:30 a.m. class that he would take, and Ben and I have worked together very closely for a pretty long time. So, uh, Ben, my process with Ben is based on that relationship, and then from there, uh, we kind of—I'll get into the process in a second. But with Dave, it was totally different. We didn't know each other at all, so the only um, the way to make up for that, I just read everything he had ever written, <laughs> mm. every podcast that I could find that uh, anything he had ever said publicly, anything he had ever typed publicly. I just tried to get inside his head as much as I could, because that's always been how I've been successful with Ben. It's a, I joke around a lot that I have, I am Ben's, my brain is an external hard drive for Ben's brain. He has downloaded a lot of what's in there into mine. And so it's, I am very aware that that is what has made our kind of 
team work so successful in the past. And I knew if I was going to be able to replicate that at all, I kind of had to get inside Dave's head as much as I could without knowing him. That's hard. But fortunately, he's a pretty um, visible figure in the CrossFit community. So just digging out everything he's ever said ever. I was pretty helpful with that. Mm -hmm. Um, But with Ben, our process is to sit in a room together and just talk. And it sounds like when you're writing a book that you would, you know, start with an outline and um, kind of go through in this like structured way. But the magic with me and Ben is that we just sit in a room and we just talk about ideas and there's no structure and it kind of takes shape eventually. But we always just start by talking about cool ideas and Ben can kind of elaborate on that a little bit more, but that's really where we start every single time. Yeah. One of the things that I, um, I think if there's a starting point, it's probably, I love to take notes on my notes app in my phone. So as I have like, um, car thoughts and I'm, I, I wait till I'm, I need to pull off the side of my <laughs> I'll, I'll, or shower thoughts, or I have a thought like thought while, um, while working out. That's probably where I have the most thoughts is like, I'll write, jot those down and I try to just categorize them. And one of them was, um, leadership, which is what this book is about. And I thought that I was writing this down and I was actually, I was to be able to, um, coach the people within my organization about what leadership looks like from, from this vantage point. And so there was this bunch of kind of like just bullet points, just like a whole bunch of different, like, just like uh, verbal diarrhea. And that's what we started with. And Christine would take those and be like, okay, let's talk about, um, how to get people to, how to uphold standards. Let's talk about that. And then, um, we talk about, let's talk about culture. Let's talk about, um, how to, um, structure an organization, um, you know, from a, um, from, uh, an ability to be able to share what you want to be able to do in the vision. And we kind of just talk through that. And as we talk through this, it spurs other ideas. And then Christine starts, researching other stuff and she comes, you know, I, or I've read a book or I've read, you know, I I probably gave Christine like four or five different books. I was like, these are kind of really big, hard driving principles for me that I've gained a lot from. She finds other ones that she lends to me. Um, and it becomes this kind of like, just as she said, this conversation where there, there is no structure. We're not trying to fit things in anywhere just yet. We're just having this big conversation and this is like the brain download type thing, but it works both ways because she's like, helping me form while I'm just like shooting from the hip and just saying stuff. She in her mind is like putting them in nicer buckets and a flow and creating a backstory to it. Um, and it's one of those things where we'll meet um, every week or every couple a uh, couple times a week in the beginning. And then when she starts to get working, then she like writes and then she comes back and literally <laughs> – Literally, like she's in the same room. She hands me what she's created. With her sitting there, I read it. Um, I make all this, the the side notes, um, and then we kind of rehash it again. And sometimes it's like, let's reform this. Let's move this over here. And sometimes it's like, this isn't it. And let's try to like, we gotta we gotta rehab the conversation. And then she pulls out her phone and videos me. She knows when I start talking fast that that's where she goes. Whoa, 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 whoa wait, wait, like. You're getting excited. Time to video where yep. I grab a marker and I go to the whiteboard and just like, whoa, 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 whoa. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the process um, we go through. And it, it's a, it's a year to two year process. Mm. Right. What'd you say, Christine? I was fortunate enough in chasing excellence to come in after the first two failed. Well, drafts. we had urgency so for me, there too, where we wanted to get that out before the next year's games because we were telling the story of the previous yep. games. And there was a timeliness to it. So there was an urgency factor. There was a deadline. So that one was like, um, like hell week. That was like, let's, let's, let's freaking go. Um, we did that in six weeks. <laughs> okay, but we didn't six weeks. We had, we had it. Yeah, we had the third draft done in six weeks. So we had a lot of work beforehand done. Mm. Um, and this one, this is, we're going on year. Uh, we're about like 18 months into this, or are we farther? 20? Yeah, I think a year and a half almost exactly. Yeah, 18 months into this one so far. So, how do you guys both, maybe either individually or as a, as a team, how do you balance the 
need to stay ambitious and the need to kind of really push yourself and the, all, the, the, the need to also be patient and not rush, rush things just because I'm ambitious. So I really wanted this to be done on July and shit. Now it's June and it's, we're not like, how do you find that right balance between the two of you in those rooms to one, not let the conversation just like, just go on endlessly and forever, which of course you guys could do, but also not push, you know, not push on the gas just because, well, we're just talking here. Like we're not actually writing the book. Like how do you, how have you guys found that right balance? Well, like Ben said, this one was a lot easier because we didn't have the time pressure that we did for chasing excellence. And one of the things that I've loved about working with Ben, particularly on this book is that the kind of mantra for everything is we're done when we're proud and mm-hmm. there's no timeline. When we started writing this book, it's not like we said, Hey, like we want to finish we want to publish it in October of 2021. We never said anything. It was, you know, it's done when we're proud. And that's always been our approach. And it's one of the reasons I think we're able to get it to where it needs to be is because even, you know, when I came back, I I did a lot of the writing for this one in Florida during COVID. And when I came back, it was, I came back in January of 2021 to finish the book, to get it across the finish Mm -hmm. line. And instead of doing that, we that was when we realized sitting in that room together for a week or two, like, Oh, we're going to, we have a totally different direction and we're going to kind of start over and just not, not having a set deadline and not having to hurry. Both of us were, it wasn't oh, like, shit, like we, we have to do this again. It was, this is the right thing. This is going to make it so much better. Like we were both really excited to start the third draft. If, it sounds strange to say, but we were both so pumped about how much better it was going to be that we didn't care that it was going to take another eight months to get it across the finish line. Cause that was the right thing. Right. Yeah. I, I really like what you pulled up there, Patrick, because I think I have that anyway, but it's really cool to be able to work with somebody that has it as well. Uh, where from the outside, it looks like patience, but from the inside, it's just kind of like, uh, eh, it, it's patience, <laughs> but <laughs> But it's also um, persistence, right? Yeah. Because it's like patience, but you're not giving up. You're actually excited about the next development. And I think Christine did a really nice job of explaining that from the, um, on the macro scale. But from the micro scale, what you asked about is like, how do you just not keep talking forever? So we have these, these sit downs, these chats. And a lot of times in the beginning, it, it's, um, it's clunky, the conversation, because we don't know what we're trying to get. And... We're trying to like, just like pull thoughts out of each other. Like, ah, that's not really it. Is it this? And it's like, ah, oh, maybe. And you go down, ah, no, no. And it's kind of like back and forth of like bouncing something off, you know, these, these, you know, imaginary walls. And then all of a sudden it's not necessarily, sometimes it's like the bouncing gets closer and closer and closer until you're like on track. But sometimes it's like, it's bouncing, it's bouncing, it's bouncing. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. And it bounces over to something completely different. And that's... And we'll either which one of those, once we get to the point where we're excited about the conversation, it's no longer clunky and it starts to flow. We don't go on forever. We go, okay, this sounds like we're there. Mm. Um, Christine, take it. And then she goes and runs with it and then brings it back because we don't want to go forever down that rabbit hole because it still might be off. So she'll go and kind of like, you know, just further it, refine it some, see how it fits into the overall story, bring it back. And then I read it, having seen it with fresh eyes again. And then I'll, then we'll have the same conversation again, where it's either like, okay, yes, this is it. Or mm, let's have the clunky, odd, weird conversation and refine it again. And it's just, it's just that over and over and over again, big, massive theme, start off with this kind of like random discussion points let it kind of bounce around, see where it goes, refine it, and so on. And what what parallels might you be able to draw on this process, the thing, what you guys have figured out that works, you know, maybe it's it's slightly specific to the two of you, but I'm curious what parallels you might be able to draw for us or that you've been able to draw for yourself and in other parts of your life that you've learned from this process and that maybe that the rest of us who maybe aren't working on a book with a co-writer can take and say, Oh, if I just look at it slightly differently, it's this, it's kind of like that. And if I take this approach, it's kind of like that. Okay. I think there's a, there's a couple. One is just like the actual working with another person. 
And um, Christine is so – like she puts a lot of work into this. But she – either she hides it incredibly, incredibly well or she has no qualms whatsoever about getting like harsh feedback. Hmm. And that I'm makes it – hiding my feelings. So that's Yeah. Not so it. she has no qualms about the harsh feedback. If I'm like – if she's – She's poured in, you know, eight to 10 days of hard earned words on a piece of paper, storytelling, writing a book, and she might come back after those 10 days or even better, a year of writing the first two copies, me being like, this isn't it. And she's like, mm. okay, what do you think might be it in a more, what do you think it might, and just like, not like, no, like, but the, you know, I think that they've, there's a story of, uh, I, it's an, um, it's an author, I believe, and he's, they said like editing is like killing off your children. It's like you just got like you work so hard to write this paragraph, to write this page, to write this chapter, to write this book, and to have it like xed out without any reservations allows me to be unfiltered with my feedback. Mm. So that first thing of this back and forth between feedback and give it and coming back and give it and being totally open with the same understanding that we have the same end goal. And if you're able to drop your ego along the way and understand it's not going to be sunshine and rainbows, it's going to take a lot of work to get to where you want to be. And it's what we talk about all the time in terms of that, that graphical representation. What we want is it for it to be linear? We want to just continue like every day for it to go up and every day it goes up and every day we make more gains and it gets better. And, but it doesn't happen like that. What it actually should feel like is there's, you don't even know if you're making progress at all. That mm. honestly is the way it feels. You have no idea if you're making progress at all. Write a book, tear it all up. Have we made any progress? Let's write another book, tear it all up. Have we made any progress? But what you actually have is you are. You're just taking these steps up and then a step back. But then you take another journey up and a step back. Another journey up and a step back. Whether we are parents, whether we're entrepreneurs, whether we're trying to improve our back squat, that's the same journey. It's going to be the exact same process for everybody. We have to understand that the process is not linear. There's bumps, there's gaps, there's barbed wire, there's the rough road that we need to navigate at all times. And when you understand what the process of creation looks like, all of a sudden it gives you this another level of patience and persistence. And it really helps to do it with somebody with uh, the same the same approach. I think part of the reason that we're able to have that approach, Ben says it like, I, you know, I'm just this is a naturally part of my character and it's just something I've always had. But the truth of the matter is that I learned how to get harsh feedback from Ben when he would review my classes every single day for three years. And we have this bedrock of trust and it's a really cool like parallel theme that it's something we talk about a lot in the book. And it's also, I think, kind of the base layer of why we work so well together is the reason Ben can give me really harsh feedback and tell me, hey, the book that you've been working on for the last year, we're going to scrap that and start over. From anybody else, that might be a lot harder to hear. But because Ben and I have this like very, very thick foundation of trust, it makes it so much easier. And I think that's probably a key takeaway too. Mm. You know, another another um, parallel that you – know, um, I agree with that, Christine, completely because we didn't have that trust when we first started. Like when you first started working here – that trust is what we talk about in the book. I mean, the book is basically about how to like create this level of trust where you can just give this feedback and you can get the most out of people. Like if I didn't have that with Christine, we wouldn't even have this book. So it's about how to create that foundational understanding of what it means to be able to tap into people and pull more out of them. And there's, um, that's what the whole, the whole book is about. But the other part of that is also just this understanding of, you know, it's, um, you know, it's a Silicon Valley approach to creation. And it's very much what I believe in as well, which is, we talked about it a little bit, but which is do not wait to make it perfect. So this is how Silicon Valley kind of revolutionized um, production. If you were to build a car, you need to make that car 
really good before you sell it to somebody. <laughs> like if the if the steering or the brakes don't work a little bit, like you're going to have massive issues. If you're creating clothing and after two washes, the seams start to come apart, like you're going to have big, massive problems. So in those, in that world, which is what we all came up through with the industrial revolution, we're making hard goods for people to use. Once sold, you never get to see them again. If you do see them again, it's because they're irate customers and they want their money back. That paradigm has completely shifted with the information age and the digital revolution flipped that upside down. And this is where the production of the build, measure, learn paradigms come in. With it, in this world, what you do is you create a MVP, a minimal viable product. Put as little work into the product as possible, as little as you can. Then once it's out there, you get feedback. And through that feedback, you understand truly what your customers want and truly where you should be putting your efforts in. Because what ends up happening, if you put in, so let's say we want to like, you know, um, um, so the parallel to this is Christine writes a little bit. Here's the feedback. Let's change it. Let's switch it. Let's write a little bit. Let's change it. Let's switch it. Let's write a little bit. Build, measure, and learn. Build, measure, and learn. Build, measure, and learn. As opposed to Christine, go off, go to, you know, we try this a little bit, but go to Florida, write a book, come back and do this. And I get it that we had to scrap the whole book twice, but during the, those first two processes, it wasn't, that wasn't the process. It was kept with the same build, measure, learn, even through the first two. And this is what the app world has created, which is they can just like, if Facebook waited to be Facebook today, it never would launch. It literally would never be a thing. If Amazon waited to be Amazon is today, it would never have been launched. If Google waited to be Google is today, it would never exist. Instead, let's make a bookstore. Let's just make, uh, let's sell some books online. They knew where they wanted to get to. They always had the idea of being the everything store, but Amazon started with this not just this one simple thing to learn as much as they could. And then from there, they iterated and changed and grew and built. And that kind of constant process, that cycle is very much what I believe in, in anything in terms of whether it's um, running a gym, whether it's training at trying to get um, somebody fit and healthy, it's just start. Like if you wait till you have everyone's, the, the, till everyone understands the full sleep protocol and the full mindset protocol and the full training protocol and the first, I mean, it's kind of intuitive, but it makes no sense. Why don't we just try to work on one little thing? Let's try to see how this goes. And maybe this is right or it's not right for somebody. And then from there, you can learn it. Because if you're like, hey, what we're going to do is go do intermittent fasting and the people won't do it. Well, you just spent so much time building this protocol. They're just going to have to like turn away from anyway. There's so much here about um, the play of ego and feedback, right? We've talked about, we've talked about it a little bit already. <clears throat> I'm curious uh, from both of you, how do you like, right? Like Christine, I, I knew you when you started at, I, I, like I knew you when you started at CompTrain and I saw the moments when you received feedback and maybe you didn't respond, right? If you were to look back and like, oh gosh, I didn't do that as well as I wish I did, right? So there's this process of learning um, always, but I'd love to, to know from both of you because what, what I'm hearing is, is this really nice interplay between the two of you of ego and feedback. And Ben, you said something really interesting that I think is worth pointing up Pointing, uh, pointing out, which is that what, because you knew that Christine can handle feedback, and when, we, when you say harsh feedback, it's not like, <laughs> just not that anybody would think that, but it's not like Ben saying, Christine, you suck. I can't believe you did this, right? It's not that kind of harsh. It's like, I know you just spent three days writing that, those three paragraphs, but they're not, they're not right yet, right? That's the kind of harsh feedback. And so, I, I, you know, so, and so what you said, Ben, was this idea of because I knew she could handle that harsh feedback, I could be honest with her. I didn't have to hold back what I was really thinking because I just didn't want to hurt her feelings or I didn't want it to be about her receiving something that I'm trying to give her, right? We're, we're in her hearing something that I wasn't trying to say, right? And so how do you, both of you individually and together, how do you start to work towards either yourself or on a team 
the opportunity to be so open to feedback, to, to have ego that is so not uh, overly present that you can be honest with each other. Where do you start? I know actually this is this is part of the book too, but it's cool that this is also part of the process of writing the book. Um, and so how, what advice do you guys have for folks out there who struggle with either giving real feedback, giving honest feedback, and getting out of our own way enough that we receive the feedback in the manner in which it's intended and not as a personal attack or a personal affront on our identity. It's so cool that you brought that up because that is essentially the culture, part one culture of the book. And the way that I only really have this one example or this one experience, but I learned it through the culture of cf &E, which Ben has you know, religiously cultivated for the last 10 years. And I came in in 2016. I came in, I was a new coach. I had come up from a gym in Washington, DC. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know how the gym worked. And my first day was a total disaster. And the foreword of Ben's book will speak to this. It's a pretty entertaining story, but it was a total disaster. I was completely, um, there was no onboarding process at CFNE at the time. And I basically did everything wrong that you could possibly do as a coach at CFNE. And uh, the members were very disgruntled and I needed a lot of work as I was a raw kind of new coach. And so the second day, um, Ben came up to me after class and he gave me like five or six pieces of feedback. And it was kind of like drinking out of a fire hose because I was so self-conscious about, um, I just wanted to him to say, Hey, great class. Like, I'm so glad that we hired you. And that was not what he was <laughs> saying at all. And I was like, has anyone ever been fired after one day? <laughs> and that was where my head was. And it's a scary place to be. And I was still very starstruck by Ben and Harry and everybody, all these amazing CFNE coaches. And the next day it was the same thing. I, you know, I went home that night and I really tried to work on my lesson plan and I implemented all the things Ben said. And then the next day, puts down his barbell and he goes out and he's writing on the windows while in the middle of a snatch progression. And I'm just like, Oh my God, what am I doing wrong now? And I was so terrified. And I think he came up, I think it was like day four and comes up to me and he was just like, Hey, it occurs to me that you think that I'm, you know, we're getting this feedback. You're getting this feedback because you're bad. He's like, I wouldn't be investing this much time in you. If I thought that you were bad, like you're a good coach. That's why we hired you. The whole point of me giving you feedback is because we're trying to make this whole thing better. We're trying to make you better. And I believe in you. And when he said that, it was like, I had, I did not realize that's where he was coming from at all. And it made the feedback like so much easier to digest. Um, and then of course, it, you know, it, it took a couple months to get used to it, but after a couple months, I loved getting it. Um, and it was just kind of, it became part of the culture. It was part of my morning every day after class you know, Ben used to come up to me and give me one piece of feedback. And then if he didn't, after a couple of months, I would like seek him out. I would go find him and be like, Hey, what's my one. And that kind of became our thing is our one. And, you know, it, that's very much part of the cf &E culture. And it took me a, a while to kind of get up to speed on that. And, uh, yeah, there it is <laughs> for Christmas one year. I think it was after that first year. I use my very primitive graphic design skills to make that for Ben. And it's a list of all of the feedback he's ever given me after class. And I like smushed it into that, uh, oh, I, word I didn't one. Know what that was for yeah. people listening. Ben just held up a little, uh, a, a framed, <laughs> like you said, a, a framed design, uh, that just said the number one, but that's really cool. Cause I'd seen that before. I don't know that I ever looked closely enough to know what it was. Yeah. Look at it closely. I got a lot of feedback from Ben in the first three months <laughs> I worked there. <laughs> Yeah, I'd say, um, but, I, 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 I just uh, expand upon that. And um, it's one of the things that I didn't do a very good job of early on with Christine um, and that we started to lean into a little bit later on. Christine, so we talk about this in the book, but basically um, when Christine was hired was in the midst of our um, – um, a renaissance inside of Cross in New England where we were very much intentionally shifting the culture. Mm -hmm. um, and – for the first 10 years of running a gym, I was a poor leader, like for sure. Um, and Christine came in right at this time that we were trying to do it better. Um, and one of the things that we instill really early on and is a massive part of our culture as a whole is this idea of 
um, as Christine said, we're like we're constantly trying to make this thing better. So there, it's not about pass fail. It's not about um, the accolades, and the, it's not about someone saying like you what you wanted. You're a good coach. Like, what does that do for anybody? Like, if someone says you're a good coach, all that does. I mean, like, if you were to take away emotion and uh, ego, like it's doing nothing. It's just it's just doing nothing. What it's doing is making the person feel good. But if somebody goes, um, when you do your warm up, what we want to do is make sure that we do X, Y, and Z. That makes somebody better. So what we have instilled in our entire staff is this level of curiosity. Call it growth mindset if you want to, but how do we get better? How and we're on this constant pursuit and mission to get better. And when that's the case, the shortcut to betterment is feedback. It's t- scratch the word feedback and replace it with being coached. Mm. And it just changes it all. So imagine like you training underneath Katrin David's daughter and you're with her every single day. You know how much knowledge she has. You know her level of expertise. You know what she's accomplished. You know she could help you out so much. But after 18 months, she still hasn't said anything to you other than good job. Like you could be doing... You as a pair could be doing so much better if she would just be willing to go, hey, have you ever thought about gripping the bar this way? Hey, have you ever thought about pacing the first round this way? Hey, have you ever... And just like all of a sudden, the growth starts happening. Well, that's what feedback is. And then it becomes the point where you don't need to sugarcoat it. It doesn't even need to be, hey, have you ever thought of... Or the criticism sandwich like, hey, you're a great coach. Um, Have you ever thought about doing this? But you're awesome. You know, you can get to like, you can shortcut that a little bit. That's necessary in the beginning. It is. It's part of the, it's part of the journey, but then you can shortcut it and realize that the principle of truth above all else, like we just have to, you have to root out truth. And the truth right now is we're not warming people up as well as we could be. Now there's a whole different ways we could do that. There's no truth of the right way, but there's different protocols. Let's start thinking about those things and understanding that clear, being super clear is being the kindest that you possibly can be to that person. What is unkind is being unclear, Mm. is saying, good job, you're a good coach, when really you don't feel that just yet. You can be a great coach. You have so much potential. What you're bringing to us is exactly the reason we hired you. Now, I I want to invest some of my time into you because I believe that you can be so, you can be great. You could be world class. And that's what we're seeking. We don't want you to be the same coach five years that you are right now. We need and we want nothing more than for your development. And all of a sudden, the, the whole paradigm of what feedback is shifts. I'm curious, Ben, uh, thinking about feedback and thinking about the, the value of it, where in your life now are you receiving feedback that is helping you get better? So uh, I'll just point to the first one, the first thing that popped in my head. I've been doing um, meditation and breath work pretty seriously, like, uh, like a five days a week type thing. Um, since the beginning of the year. So we're going on uh, month nine. Mm-hmm. Um, yesterday, I worked with a breath coach for the first time. So um, a meditation coach where they're going like, hey, this is actually how you, this is how you're doing it. This is how you should do it. So I'm very much trying to get feedback. Um, I think that we've talked about on, on the podcast before. Um I've, I've worked with a uh, business coach, business consultants, uh, public speaking coaches. So um, I want the feedback. I'm so lucky that I am married to Heather. Uh, she has a blog called HB, Heather Bergeron, unfiltered. So mm-hmm. she, she'll she just, it's not like she's trying to tiptoe around it. She's she's giving me feedback a lot of the time. It's interesting, yeah. Um, talked about it as well in terms of the beginning of this podcast with um, my best friend, Derek, who's this peer that I, I look up to that mentors me as well. Um, I, I, you know, even my daughter, Maya, you know, Maya is uh, 21 going on 50. She's, 
she's like wise beyond her years and she, she is. um pushes so if she doesn't see something if she if she if she, if she sees something that she sees as whack, out of whack she calls me on it um so i try to get his feedback from every which way as i possibly can i um i have my team try to push back on the programming that I give the athletes. I have the athletes push back on the programming. So it's something I can always, always do better for sure. Um, it's one of the things that I'm fairly aware of trying to get better at it. Like I realize where some of the gaps are and I'm trying to seek those things out to try to make sure that I am getting the feedback. Um, bit of a chicken and egg question and one that sounds binary and I know it's not, but if you guys both had to point out, you know, cause we're, we're, we're talking a lot about this interplay between ego and feedback. And when that you can quiet your ego, you're more receptive to feedback in your experience, both personally and just uh, working with a lot of people is the right place to start that saying, okay, I'm going to focus on my ego and try to quiet that so that I can receive or hear the feedback that's being given to me? Or is it, I need to seek out more feedback. And in that process, by virtue of repetitions, my ego will eventually quiet. Is there one that you've seen or that you've experienced is like, if because I leaned into that or because I received that or because I focused on that, the other side of this coin was made better? Christina, I would you say, I'd, I'd probably say neither for me because when mm -hmm. I moved up here, it wasn't because I knew I wanted to get better. I wanted to be a better coach. If I was going to do CrossFit for a living, I wanted to play in the pros, so to speak. I didn't want to, I wanted to play for the Patriots. And I didn't go into that knowing like, I'm going to go up to CrossFit New England because I'm going to get feedback and it's, I'm going to get coaching and I'm going to have to quiet my ego. That really wasn't part of the calculus. It was like, I want to get better. And so I'm going to go where I know I'm going to get better. And I really had no idea what I was walking into. And mm. it was really the environment that made me better. It was the culture of this great institution that helped me do that. And it, um, I had to learn a lot about quieting my ego and accepting harsh feedback, but I didn't go into that intentionally um, or consciously. I just put myself where all the good people were and let it happen. Hmm. I, I would um, echo that and say it, it um, I won't say it's either, but I would say it's, um, it operates at the speed of trust. Mm -hmm. So if you can create a trusting relationship between two people, that's where it'll go. Now the trust can happen through repetition, as you said, and it could go to the point where you're just like, the problem with that is when I wasn't a good leader, that's what I would do. And I broke people sometimes. It's like, I'm gonna give you feedback and feedback and feedback and never step back and see that I haven't established the trust. And um, it's, it breaks, but not just like breaking a stallion and now it's like ready to be like <laughs> broke them. Like, I don't want to be a coach anymore. Yeah. That's terrible. That's a bad leadership. That's, that's the opposite of what we're trying to do. But I will say from the person receiving the feedback, if you can become aware of the ego and let me, I'll get plenty of this in a second. What I mean by that. If you can come, become aware of it, you can quiet it. If you can quiet it, you can accept it. So mm -hmm. it is that is the shortcut. It is the hack. If you can bypass your ego, it's all of a sudden this whole thing takes massive steps forward. You then don't need to seek out the leader that speaks to you the way you want to be spoken to, which is what so many people are searching for. So many people, just like, the, you know, um, Crossfitter hurts their shoulder. They go to one doctor. The doctor's like, you have a labrum tear. You need surgery. Go to another one. Like, you have a labrum tear. You need to take a year off. And then I go to another one. It's like, you, need a, you have a labrum tear. Just, you know, rub some salt on it and get back in there. Like, that's the one I want to go to. It's, yeah. like, it's like, you don't wait for the person to speak your language. If you have melted your ego, you can take feedback from everybody from every different, different um, avenue to the point of like someone yelling at you, like, your coaches are not paying enough attention to my kids in the teens class. Your coaches are not – and like all of a sudden you're like – instead of getting defensive, you're like, awesome. Give it to me. Like I, I want this feedback. Like if you can – this is the hack. Now, what I mean by ego is not um, I'm the best. I am special. 
It is ego as the voice in your head that is a storytelling machine that is trying to find reason and fit into the paradigm, fit into the condition, into, into the story you've been telling yourself forever, which is maybe it's like, I run a great gym. I'm a good coach. Someone says to me, it's like, no, they're wrong. And all of a sudden now you're defensive. But if that's gone, if you're not trying to fit in this feedback into the narrative that you've been telling yourself forever, all of a sudden it's just like, give it to me. I want it to, like wife says like, hey, we need to have a talk. Um, You're not, uh, I'm not feeling loved anymore. Instead of you going like, what the hell is she talking about? I pour everything I have in this relationship. I've been working my ass off. I'm at the, like, and you go, whoa, cool. Okay, let's go. What do you mean? And if you can let down, and really, it's just a conditioning. We are on autoplay. We're just on autoplay. And it's the same thoughts are coming through again and again and again. And everything that doesn't fit into our nice buttoned up little story, we get rattled. We get super rattled. And if we can step away from that and just get into this like, um, kind of like you said, binary, where it's like, just like, this is feedback. Bring it on. You know, it, it's like someone says something to you on um, social media. Instead of getting all wrapped around the axle, just go, is there some truth to this? Can I, can I learn from this? And if there's not, then go, okay, that's the weirdo that still lives mom in his basement. And, you know, he's just like, he has a, he's trolling. He doesn't even, he's never posted anything. All he does is say bad things about other people because it, that might be the case. But before you go there, you go, I want to learn. I want, this is a data point. Can I learn from this? Example of this real world is um, we had, we posted a workout last week and some people had some questions about it. They're like, well, I don't get it. That's, they were literally going like, I don't get it. Well, how does this workout work? And a few people on my staff were going like, dude, dude, just read the notes. It's mm-hmm. in the coaching notes. And another person were like, do people not, and another person on our staff were like, do people not know how to read? <laughs> I went, whoa, 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 whoa. Like if they're saying, I don't get it, they don't get it. Like this should be simple. We're not doing like open up the user's manual and try to figure out the table of contents. And on page 77 is where you find out how to do this thing. It's a workout. This should be so simple and intuitive. And if they don't get it, it's on us. Like if a kindergartner can't understand this, it's on us. This is such valuable feedback. Now, if they didn't say anything, if they didn't come in, then we don't get that feedback. And if you get defensive and go, that can't they read? It's in the coach notes they get it. You don't get the feedback. It's again, it goes back to the very first thing we just talked about. This is about growth. It's about curiosity. It's about how can we make this thing better? And what you'll tend to see then is that feedback is nothing more than data points. Just take it for what it is. It's a data point. If you accumulate enough data points, you can learn things. Love that. Christine, last question to you. Uh, other than putting the final touches on unlocking potential, what are you working on? What are you excited about working on? What uh, What's next for you? I don't know if I'm allowed to say. <laughs> um, Give us a hint at least. Well, Katrin, David's daughter, and Annie Thor's daughter and I um, have recently finished a project that is also coming out around the same time as nice. um, Unlocking Potential. Can't get into the details of what that is, but um, coming this fall, um, we have something coming out. It is a piece of writing. <laughs> uh, and then <laughs> um, <clears throat> beyond that, maybe um, potentially, well, you heard Ben say it. We have Ben and I have at least three more books to write. So we'll probably get started with number three here this fall, which I'm very much looking forward to. And then um, potentially with some other games athletes doing some storytelling. Love it. Where can people find you on the internet uh, so that they can tr- uh, track you, so that they can keep uh, aware of what uh, what these secret projects are? <laughs> Instagram's the best bet. My na- uh, username is Christine DCA. Hit me up. Find you there for writing and videos and pictures of your dog. Mostly pictures of my dog, to be honest. <laughs> Love it. Thank you, Christine. I really appreciate the time. Thank you both uh, for uh, for the book. Uh, it's very good. Folks can find it again. It's called Unlocking Potential. Um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your ratings and your reviews. Ben and I will be back with another episode of Chasing Excellence next week. 
You can get every episode of Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Until next time, thank you for listening.